see people on Instagram just like throw random, you know, joint circles and just try to explore range of motion and just try to go as big as they can with the circles and don't really understand them. Even for it's other why they're doing their intent behind it. So why is it important to have the understanding of uh, the joints control their particular origination as opposed to just a joint circle for the sake of taking your joints through the range of motion? I think people get confused with cars. Uh, if they haven't studied the system, because like you said, you're looking at someone doing a circle with your joint and the gut reaction is to say, why would you spend time doing this with a hockey player who can otherwise be, you know, spend time lifting weight or getting stronger or, or, or whatever. And I think that people don't really understand the, the why the cars are being implemented. I don't just take people at seminars and say, everyone stand up and start making circles with your joints, right? That would be, it would be pretty ignorant of someone to think that people come from all over the world to these seminars only to have us stand there and say, okay, let's do joint circles. Like when people say, that's not new, I do joint circles. It's like they're insulting all of the you know thousands of people who have taken and studied the system into saying that we somehow fooled them into coming to see us just so we can teach them to do joint circles. It's much more complicated, as you know, uh, than just doing joint circles. And another thing people get confused at is how can these joint circles provide you all of this information? How can How is that your assessment? How can you tell if an athlete is good to go uh, based on whether or not their, circle, their shoulder can make a circle? And I think people fundamentally are misrepresenting what cars are and why we're doing them. Uh, cars is a an expression of what a joint is capable of doing. So there's a term in the literature right now called workspace, which if people haven't heard about this in the literature yet, they either haven't been reading recent literature or they haven't come up and stumbled across it yet, but they will. So this concept of workspace will be the, the big outcome measure moving forward. And what workspace uh, looks at is, if I'm using my shoulder, if I draw a circle, which people call it, or if I do cars with the shoulder, if you try to give me as big a circle as you can, if you imagine that I'm taking a pen and as I draw, I'm drawing this big, large circle, right? And what the researchers are finding now are when you have aberrant joints, problems in joints, when you draw these circles, you'll start to see breaks in the circle. So you'll see the circle isn't as fluid. It's not moving as well. Um, you'll see a decreased amount of workspace. So for example, one person, their arm comes all the way up here, another person does this, and they come over. That person, the second person, they're dealing with less workspace than their counterpart who can, who can draw that big circle. So how, what do you extrapolate from that? Well, if you don't have a lot of workspace, the first thing that I'm gonna look at is whether you have enough capsular space, and there's a difference. So when I'm doing shoulder cars, where my hand can go, this big circle is the workspace, but in order to demonstrate my workspace, the humerus and the glenoid have to move independent of one another so that I can actually draw this circle. So now, if I'm looking at someone's workspace, I go, there's something wrong. The first thing I gotta find out is, are they actually moving through that workspace with the intended joint? So if I say, do shoulder cars, and the person does this, and then they start to do this, that person is demonstrating a workspace which is not only limited by the shoulder, or, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say that. They're showing me a workspace which is which is demonstrating limitations in the shoulder, which are then being compensated for by movements elsewhere. So if I see someone can't give me a good workspace, I say, is there enough space in the joint itself? So if we go in the joint itself, so here's a little diagram. I'll just draw one bone here and another bone here. And then I'll draw a capsule around this joint. So the capsule is this enclosed space which really dictates how much motion the joint is allowed to have. So let's call this a shoulder joint. If I want to flex my shoulder, if I want to extend my shoulder, if I want to abduct my shoulder, this bone has to move relative to that bone in order to demonstrate my workspace. Now what happens if your capsule is for lack of a better word, let's call it fibrotic. The capsule's tightened. Let's say the capsule is now 
almost like shrink wrapped around your joint. So now you don't have that extra bit in the capsule. This person doesn't have enough space within the capsule to allow the bones to couple properly to then allow them to demonstrate a good workspace towards forming. So as soon as I see there's something wrong with the, the general workspace, the first thing I have to find out is, does the joint itself have enough room to allow this workspace to happen? And one reason why CARS is so good is it allows me to see this, and then when I see that's a problem, it allows me to go right into here with a, slightly, a slight alteration of the CARS, I can then understand whether or not the joint has the prerequisite space to even allow this workspace to be attained. If that joint space is restricted, and this is what I tell a lot of people, it doesn't matter how good your training is. If your shoulder, your humerus, doesn't move relative to your glenoid fossa, it doesn't matter if you have a movement coach and a movement coach working with a performance coach working with a strength and conditioning coach. If this bone cannot move relative to this bone, then by definition, you do not have a workable shoulder. That's it. So you can say, you know, well, what exercises are you doing with this athlete to make them, you know, punch harder, slap, take a better slap shot? And I'll say, well, before you get a faster slap shot or a harder punch, do you actually have the joint which you're needing in order to perform that slap shot or perform that punch? CARS allows us to see that. So what we do is we take a step backwards. Instead of looking at athletic movement, we look at the athlete themselves. What are their joints capable of? Because if there's restriction here, it doesn't matter how hard you train, you can't train your way past this restriction. For example, if you're trying to do a shoulder exercise, overhead press, lateral raise, whatever it is with your shoulder, and I say, show me what your shoulder can do, and you give me a cars that looks like that. So I can obviously say that your, your capsular space does not give you the workspace necessary to do exercises above your shoulder. Because as soon as you bring your arm above your shoulder, the rest of your body starts to move in compensation. Now you could say, why is that a bad thing? It's a bad thing because when I want to do something with my shoulder, asking my thoracic spine or my elbow to make believe it's a shoulder, to compensate for my lack of shoulder, it doesn't work well because your elbow is not your shoulder, nor is your thoracic spine. There is something to being a shoulder. And this is another thing that people get confused about. They, they, shoulders have an intention, they have a purpose. If your shoulder cannot carry out the purpose of a shoulder, then any subsequent things you do with your shoulder are not gonna be done with your shoulder. They're gonna be done with other areas of your body. And as soon as you allow another area of the body to compensate for something that's not working, your elbow doesn't work as a shoulder as good as a shoulder works as a shoulder. Your mid thoracic spine doesn't work as well as a shoulder as a shoulder works as a shoulder. So as soon as that compensation is allowed to proceed, the compensatory area is going to break down as it's trying to take the job of the shoulder. And then we talk about workspace. Is that just a fancy term in literature for uh, joint space? Now, they synonymous with the same thing between workspace and the actual space in the joint itself, like we're talking about the ability to build it? Not necessarily. So I will say this. If you don't have enough capsular space, you can never get the, the, the workspace. Right? If this is restricted, you can't work your way past this, but you can have a capsular space which is free, but then you can have overriding muscular tightness that causes your workspace to falter, or there might be habitual patterns that have been developed that might make your workspace falter. And, and that's why there's more to this system than just watching people do circles. When we do circles, we, there, there's a sequence of events. When we see something's wrong, we first go to the capsule because we know if there's something wrong there, no matter what you do out here, it's, it's not going to fix it. So let's say that you have restricted capsule in your glenohumeral joint, um, and you also have generalized muscular tightness in and around the shoulder, which I would expect. You can't ignore the fact that your shoulder can't move independently and start to treat these muscles hoping that your workspace will improve. 
It, it doesn't work that way because even if you relax the overlying musculature, when you go to move the shoulder that you don't have, that shoulder will signal to your brain that there's something that doesn't work well. And then when something doesn't work well, your brain sends back a signal telling the surrounding musculature to tighten up. That's actually a direct thing that we know about in the literature. So if I give you a central nervous system here, and then I'll give you, let's say, a joint capsule there, and then we have, let's call it an overlying muscle here. Okay. If you take proprioception from a muscle, uh, if you take proprioception from a tendon, if you take proprioception from a ligament, what happens is the signal goes to the spinal cord. And then at the spinal cord level, and I'll just blow that up here, at the spinal cord level, the signal that comes in synapses with what we call an interneuron in the spinal cord. That interneuron then decides what to do with that signal. So if the signal coming from the muscle is pain, then the interneuron will relay it to the spinal thalamic tracts, and then it'll start to send the signal up to the, the thalamus and the surrounding areas. It will also reflexively cause that muscle to tighten uh, because, because it's a pain signal. So that little relay, it, it might only take a few milliseconds, but it's delayed. So in other words, all information coming from your receptors once it gets to the spinal cord, there is a slight delay in the spinal cord where a decision is made. Do I have to kick this up to the central nervous system or can I simply use a reflex to handle the problem? That decision takes time. However, the literature also tells us that there's one particular tissue where there is no delay. And that specific tissue is your joint capsule. So from your joint capsule, there's something called type 2 afferents. And these type 2 afferent signals, when they send information to the spinal cord, they actually end up bypassing the interneuron and they go directly up to the cerebellum as well as to the thalamus. And then from the thalamus, it goes directly into the proper areas of the cortex. So what did we learn? We learned that there's something, there's in fundamental information located or being generated from the proprioceptors in this capsule that your awareness deems more important than any of these other tissues. The capsule is the first layer of tissue that any movement is going to um, activate. So as soon as you move, you know, if you take two bones and you move them a millimeter, the overlying muscles don't feel that yet. The first thing to feel the motion is always going to be the capsule. So now we have two bits of information. Number one, when a motion occurs, the first feeling of motion is going to be in the capsule. And number two, the capsule's information seems to be of higher importance to our central nervous system. Why is that? Because based on the capsule signal, the central nervous system then decides how to set the tone of the muscles. That's important. So let's say, for example, we have a shoulder where I look at your workspace, the workspace is not good. Then I look specifically at your capsular space, and for the shoulder we use internal rotation. Internal rotation is the first thing you lose when you have shoulder problems. It's the capsular pattern of the shoulder. So if I have internal rotation that's severely blocked, what I'm saying is there, there's, there's not enough space in this capsule to allow proper coupling between these two bones. If that's the case, if there's a problem in the mechanics, problem in the space, pain in the capsule, that signal gets sent to the brain saying something's wrong. Brain sends signal down saying protect that area, tighten up all these muscles. And here's where people go wrong. You go to a, a, a therapist of any kind, soft tissue therapist, the soft tissue therapist goes, wow, your infraspinatus is tight. Wow, your supraspinatus, your pec, your rotator cuff is tight. I have an idea. Let's just rub that. Okay, now follow me. So you go ahead and you rub supraspinatus, infraspinatus, the areas. 
when you rub something, something called touch-induced analgesia ensues. If something hurts here, if I go like this, it's gonna feel better, right? The pain levels will go down. So you start to rub these, this muscle and that muscle because you feel they're tight, okay? You make them feel better, pain goes down, the body temporarily allows those muscles to relax. And then the day later, the person goes, I woke up the next morning after a massage, oh, I was tight again. And they say, oh, maybe you need to massage the muscles more. Two days later, oh, I'm tight again. Go for another one. Three days, oh, I'm tight again. So then you start to have this game where the therapist goes, you just have to keep coming back to me so I can constantly relax your muscles, which really is not the point of a therapist. The point of a therapist is, is more to find the problem and fix it. So what these people are doing wrong is, is that they're, they're hitting the wrong target. You can rub this muscle as much as you want. You can break up scar tissue, whatever it is you think you're doing, all you want. As soon as you move the joint that that muscle surrounds, if that capsule doesn't display enough space for proper coupling, if there's any pain, if there's anything wrong at that level, signal gets fired, response tightens that muscle back up again. And then people just get into this dance where what they should be doing is working from the inside out. If that doesn't have space, all of the rest of this stuff is, is symptomatic at best with regards to treatments. So this all comes back to cars. So once again, you bring me a person with this shoulder pain, all of this stuff happens. If you show me this, if you show me the, the fact that I can't move this bone relative to that bone, all of the other findings are superfluous findings. Uh, you know, yeah, you have impingement of your supraspinatus. You have a bursitis problem. You have trigger points in your infraspinatus. You have, all of these things could definitely be the result of the fact that you don't really have a joint. And what I mean by you don't have a joint, you don't have enough space for this bone to move relative to this bone. And I'll tell you, if you want the easiest definition of a joint, think about it as the space between two bones. This is a synovial joint, of course. The space between two bones is your joint. That's what allows that bone to move relative to that bone. If there's no space between the, this joint and this bone can't move relative to this bone, then you no longer have a joint. And if you don't have a joint, giving you exercises to perform with that joint are not gonna go well. So you give me a professional athlete, and instead of doing you know, snatches and, and, and overhead presses and all of this, you know, what people deem to be really cool and effective sports exercises, What's the point of all that if you don't have a shoulder? You, you want to squat. You want to, be the, you want to put on a bunch of, of, of weight on your squat. And then I come up and I say, you know what? You don't really have a hip. And then I ask the person, are hips important for squatting? And the person goes, yeah. And I say, well, what makes you think that you're going to be able to continuously squat and continuously get more and more load and, and more and more adaptation? if you don't have a hip and your entire squat is being built on a compensation, and how long before that compensation breaks and, and the tissue compensating for your lack of hip ends up causing problems? Um, when there's a reduction in, in workspace, um, whether it's acute or a chronic case, um, we were talking about neurological tension and Tiger joint up there. Yep. Um, how would it, that differ with addressing or treating it with FRFRC if there's an acute case of a neurological tension versus a chronic case of neurological tension? Okay, so that's a good question. Uh, in, a, in an acute case, first off, I'll say in an acute case of pain, when someone, pain is the ultimate limiter to, to movement, right? So a lot of uh, younger therapists, they make the mistake when someone comes in and they're in an acute amount of pain, they have all of these ideas, I want to create space, I want to create capsule space, I want workspace, I want mobility, I want strength, I want this, I want that. So they end up aggressively treating the person, prescribing a whole bunch of exercises. And um, that's, that's a, a rookie mistake. If someone's in a state of pain, uh, it's the job of the therapist to begin to deal, if there's pain, if there's inflammation, these things supersede especially acutely, super speed seat these goals. So the idea there would be to try to limit their pain. How do you limit their pain? Uh, well, pain science tells us that the majority of us limiting their pain is education-based, it's activation-based. But to say that someone comes in with an acutely painful shoulder, 
and we're gonna say just just ignore the pain, go and do what you were doing before. I don't agree with that. There are ways to reduce pain levels even symptomatically, um, and those symptomatic results allow the person to move more. And the fact that they can move more really is the therapy. Um, so in acute cases of, of, of spasm, you know, a lot of times you can't even get to the joint to assess it. A lot of the times you just have to deal with this acute spasming so that the joint presents itself to you and then you can subsequently determine what's going on with the joint. Is that causing the spasm to occur? But you also bring up a good point of the difference between neurological tightening and mechanical tension and how we treat it differently. So if I'm assessing someone's joint, just because a muscle's tight does not um, give you enough information for you to conclude I should rub it or I should drive my elbow into it or I should take a metal object and start scraping at it. Uh, a muscle being tight doesn't, doesn't tell you uh, the, the, the histopathology as to why it's tight. And if you don't understand the histology of the pathology, you really shouldn't be treating it. So if somebody says my traps are tight, my hamstrings are tight, it doesn't mean just randomly stretch them. It doesn't mean just randomly get them crushed on a foam roller because the question has to become, well, why are they tight? Or what's the actual finding? And there's a difference between my muscles neurologically tight versus in this area of the muscle, I feel some aberrant tension. If there's aberrant tension in this area of the muscle, an FR practitioner will put tension into that area and then use movements to try to, in time, reorganize that disorganization in the connective tissue. But if you're assessing a tissue and the entire muscle is tight or the entire muscle's reactive, so let's say I, I go to extend the arm and the whole bicep contracts, that's a, a neurologically generated tightness. And if you go ahead to try to rub that neurological tightness, you can rub a, a neurologically tight muscles until your thumb is a nub, and you're not gonna you're not gonna actually change the problem. Just like you can take someone who has capsular restriction, which is signaling to the brain to tighten the muscles, you can rub those muscles for as long as you want, as long as that capsule is not working, and as long as that signal is aff aberrant that exact same signal is gonna tell you to tighten that muscle again. So to therapists, they have to be able to differentiate, is this mechanical tension caused by disorganization of tissue, or is this neurologically tight? Once again, in, in, in the FRS system, functional range systems, we specifically take time uh, to teach the therapist how to tell the difference. And, and that's gonna save you a heck of a lot of time because I will never rub uh, a neurologically tight muscle, um, just like I would never, you know, uh, electrically stimulate mechanical tension. One requires mechanical input over time, the other one requires altering neural signaling, and they're not the same thing and they can't be dealt with in the same fashion. Uh, one thing I wondered was earlier on in my career when I started learning about that far and FRC. Um, I started to question the use of manual therapy and why it was important. And we can do the same thing with FRC inputs, particularly uh, like talking about internal versus external inputs. If I can still put in load and directional load with pale subtraction, as I mentioned, contraction between the patient, why is it necessary to even utilize external inputs, or why is it even necessary to have manual therapists? If you just do that with active inputs from. So the question that you're really asking is what's the point of manual input when someone could otherwise stretch or do pails and rails for themselves. Um, and there's a few ways to tackle this. Let's say that I take a particular muscle here. And these, of course, are the muscle fibers. Okay. So you imagine that this muscle has to elongate and this muscle has to contract. Um, and when you're doing that, you imagine that uh, fibers will slide past one another to elongate, uh, other fibers uh, will have to be stretched. So let's say that I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stretch this muscle. And one thing I want to point out is that I'm drawing this two-dimensionally, but a muscle is not a two-dimensional structure. So a muscle has depth. So if I cut a muscle cross-section and we look at it like this, you'll see that we have a bunch of 
fibers that make bundles and other fibers making other bundles. So we have this kind of this situation where we have fibers everywhere, right? Thousands and thousands of fibers make up a muscle. And to be honest with you, every single muscle fiber is in its own right, its own muscle. Every single muscle fiber has its own stress strain curve. Uh, every single muscle fiber follows, follows all of the rules of physiology, just like the, the large muscle. So every one of these fibers is in fact a muscle. Now, you go ahead and you do a stretch. Let's say this is a hamstring, so I'm doing a hamstring stretch. The assumption is that the stretch force will be felt throughout the entire hamstring. But let's say that at this tissue depth, there is disorganization in the connective tissue. Now, people will say, well, how do you know this disorganization? Let's not get into that bigger topic. The fact of the matter is, is if you sit in on any surgical case, which I've done hundreds of times, when you look at tissue and you open people up, when there are uh, joints that are osteoarthritic, history of injuries, the, the muscle, of course, has more disorganization than if you were to take someone who has never injured that muscle or let's say a teenager's muscle where there's, there's less disorganization. Now, that's just entropy. Someone who has more damage, more usage, an injury, there is tissue injury that occurs at a microscopic level, which means there are scenarios where there is, they call this scar tissue, but I like to just think of it as disorganization. Disorganization in this area. Now let's say that we go ahead and we say, forget soft tissue, let's just stretch. Well, the problem is, is that all of the thousands of fibers in the immediate area, they can always compensate for this disorganization by stretching more or by sliding past other fibers. So, you know, we have this area here of, of connective tissue, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you can call it fibrosis, you can call it disorganization. If I go to stretch this muscle, well, this tissue here will just stretch more, and that tissue there will just stretch more. And what ends up happening is that this particular area is not even being uh, stimulated by the stretch input because you have compensation along each side. So now if we go to stretch this muscle, right, and there's connective tissue, whatever you want to call it, fibrosis, disorganization, whatever you want to call it here, the tissues on either side or in a three-dimensional scenario, the, the, the fibers all around that particular area, they're just going to stretch more to compensate for the fact that there is no stretching occurring here. So people think that you stretch a muscle, all of the muscle equally gets the, the, the force, but that's not true. If there's disorganization here, these fibers will stretch more, these fibers will stretch more, and the input will not be felt in this particular region. And if forces are not felt in the exact region where the disorganization occurs, then this tissue is not going to decide to reorganize. Because as I say many times, force is the language of cells. These cells don't have brains. They don't know what they're doing per se. So it's not like they're going to decide to reorganize. We have to put force in there. Now, we get back to soft tissue. So soft tissue simply allows us to target where the stretch goes. So if I have an input coming in from my thumb here, even if I can somehow bow that tissue or preload that tissue, I effectively increase the amount of stretch occurring at that exact spot. And if I increase the stretch at occurring at that exact spot, I can potentially put forces into that tissue along the lines that I need the tissue to reorganize to convince it to start to uh, reorganize along the lines of force. Now, I would never do soft tissue input in absence of then, we call soft tissue input external inputs, muscle contractions, we call them internal inputs. I would never simply give external inputs. I always match external inputs with internal inputs. All I'm doing with this external input is trying to prime the environment so that internal inputs will then start this reorganization process in time. This is where people get confused. People look at research on fascia and they say, 
A study says that in order to break fascia, you have to put such a high amount of load in that no soft tissue therapist puts that amount of load in. You'd end up damaging the person. To that person, I say, when did anybody ever say that we were breaking fascia? If someone thought that you were breaking connective tissue, those are just words that we put together to describe something far more complex. But at no point in my career, uh, that I, I've never said that we're breaking adhesions, I've never said that we're breaking fascia, I, I don't know any line of research that could possibly make you feel that that's what you're doing with soft tissue. All that I can see from the literature is that force is the language of cells, and if you want cells to respond, you have to apply a particular force repeatedly in order to eventually remold. So for that purpose, we use soft tissue work simply to prime the area, get it ready, um, get it to, to start to listen to these tissue inputs. Um, whether this just be by decreasing pain um, or by uh, touch-induced analgesia or by signaling into that tissue, there's many reasons to justify why you would use soft tissue in conjunction with training. Um, even in the literature, you can, but I, would, I would, cannot sit here and say that I have a good amount of research to justify only doing soft tissue work. That is, that is not something that I can say the literature justifies, nor in my opinion does logic, common sense, and the laws of the physical universe tell me that rubbing someone for five minutes is going to cause a long-lasting change in connective tissue. I've never seen a study in my history, and I've never had someone present me a study that demonstrates that you know, a, a simple five minute amount of input into a tissue can la lead to a lasting change. I've never seen this research in the history of my career. All that I've read is that for tissue to change, for connective tissue to change, it takes repeated stimuli uh, on a regular basis through time to eventually reorganize connective tissue. And that's why we combine external inputs with internal inputs every time we do soft tissue work.